Before my days in New England, I was born to a woman named Aldine, living on the streets of Chicago, originally from Appalachia of West Virginia. No one knew of Aldine's pregnancy with me. She was without a dependable partner. I was abandoned probably before birth, then transported to Boston as a legal adoptee at three days of life without any documents of cultural or medical history. I was reminded daily that I will never amount to anything useful and that I should know how to obey to a man's wish. I remember hearing, can't you see how other girls your same age are making a life for themselves? Why are you so stupid? Without anything useful to talk about, you don't even have a personality. Eventually, I found the road of escape and moved to Quebec, Canada, living down the street from the American draft dodgers. I found my friend Luke. Arriving into a foreign country with just the belongings on my back, leaving behind a dysfunctional and fractured life, all I wanted was to create a new start for myself. I am not a city dweller, but found comfort leaving behind any and all connections to a former identity. I decided not to return to the States and create a home in Montreal. For just $25 a week and baking bread for a small cafe, I was putting down roots, my self-worth. Luke, who lived across the hall from me, became my best friend, although we didn't speak each other's language. The two of us attended concerts, took endless rides on the transit system, and played games learning each other's native tongue. Luke was a life-changing event for me, a real friend. After a few years of living as an illegal immigrant, I surrendered myself back to my previous home in the suburbs of Boston. Luke followed me, then took to hitchhiking to the West Coast. We lost contact finding different adventures. He was deported back to Canada to eventually end his life with a bullet and gun. I lost a friend that could never be replaced. I wanted desperately to have my own solid identity. The loss I felt over the accumulated years following took me to be a victim of a stroke, heart failure, diabetes, advanced obesity, and searching for my own biological origins. 50 years later, I made a contact with his family and feel connected to my friend again. I am now a volunteer at the local farms here in Chaffee County and also assist at the food bank pantries to prepare meals for the homeless shelters. I found Chaffee County to be open to diversities and willing to allow individuals of varied backgrounds to speak aloud. My favorite saying is of two gentlemen on a mountaintop. One asks, why are we here? The other responds, because we are not all there. The one word I would use to describe myself growing up is fat. From a very early age, I learned to use food for comfort, to cope with life's stresses. Compulsive overeating, weight gain, and numerous attempts to diet and exercise ruled my life. Ironically, I became a nurse, so I knew all about nutrition and the importance of healthy lifestyles. I was lucky to have a wonderful career and a loving, supportive family but I lived a very sedentary life in a very obese body. It wasn't until I moved to Salida that my life changed dramatically. All of a sudden I was surrounded by people who were active, biking, walking, hiking, skiing, snowshoeing. I decided to join a hiking group to get to know my community and soon I was hiking on a regular basis. I found much to my surprise that I enjoyed working up a sweat tromping up a hillside. When I was turning 70, a dear friend suggested we hike 70 miles to celebrate. 
and I really embraced this idea. We started hiking the Colorado Trail and found it quite challenging, but so much fun that we decided to keep going the next year. In the meantime, I started changing my eating habits and found that weighing less made hiking much easier. Six years later, we had completed hiking the entire 485 miles of the trail, and I truly amazed myself. In the fall of 2022, another friend and I walked the 500-mile Camino de Santiago in Spain in six weeks, which was truly a life-changing experience. I have learned many lessons along the way. One is that I have a new appreciation for how awesome my feet are. Also, you are never too old to profoundly change your life and adopt new healthy habits. I no longer need medications for high cholesterol and blood pressure, which has been such a gift. I learned not only did I love hiking and walking, but I needed it for my physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual health. I am so grateful for the many blessings in my life and feel a need to share with others the joy I get from walking. I truly believe that movement is medicine and everyone can benefit by going on a walk every day or two. I have recently been working on a grassroots walking movement in the county called Chafee Walks. We are offering free guided walks and hikes for people of all ages and abilities. For me, at age 76, being in the sunshine, fresh air, and moving and connecting with others puts me in my happy place. Now the one word I use to describe myself is fit. My family, the Haineses, left their village in England in 1682, searching for a place they could have the freedom to practice their faith. William Penn was the English Quaker granted the land that became Pennsylvania. He and a group of prominent Quakers owned land in West Jersey, and he encouraged his fellow Quakers to settle there. My ancestors heard these stories of religious freedom and how Penn parceled out acres to prospective settlers. They sailed across the Atlantic Ocean on a ship named Amity to claim 100 acres of farmland. Our family historian was Uncle Bob. He caught the genealogy bug, and I discovered it was contagious. I helped him with computer searches and investigating our family tree. We spent hours traipsing through graveyards and in our local historical societies. Our branch of the Haineses continued to farm for the next 330 years. My family lived on a dairy farm where Guernsey and Holstein cows grazed in lush green pastures. The dairy had a processing plant where workmen pasteurized milk and made ice cream. Those were the days of home delivery, and dairy products and ice cream were delivered to restaurants and homes by our fleet of trucks. The best part about living in a farm was having a grandfather who raised Shetland ponies. It was a little girl's paradise where mares and foals frolicked in the pastures each spring. As a member of the 4-H club, I learned to sow, raise livestock, and show ponies. We farmed using tractors and hay balers, and I often wondered what it was like living in an earlier time, turning piles of earth with a plow and cutting hay with a sickle. 
Five years ago, I too, like my ancestors, crossed an ocean. Not the Atlantic, but the Pacific, to visit Nepal. After flying to Kathmandu and then Pokhara, I traveled by jeep to where the road ended. My journey took me to villages in the Annapurna region. I trekked on pathways made of steep stone steps where I focused on every step since each was a different height. Everything not grown or crafted in the community had to be carried to the villages on the backs of men, women, or mules. Men were using water buffalo to plow the fields and women used sickles to cut hay and pile it in tall mounds. I watched an old woman beat millet with a wooden paddle to separate the grain from the shaft. I was astonished to see that they were probably using the same farm practices that my ancestors did 300 years ago. I felt like I had stepped into a time machine. By traveling halfway around the world to a foreign land, I witnessed how hard farming must have been for my Quaker ancestors and still is for many people in Nepal. My question, what was it like to live in earlier times, was answered. While riding in my dad's car, I'd stare out the window, dreaming of riding a beautiful horse, jumping the ditches, doing the serpentine around trees, all while our manes were just flowing in the wind. See, I was one of those little girls who was born horse crazy. I remember pestering my older cousin on the ranch to saddle the horses so we could go ride. Dad bought me my first horse when we lived in Lakewood, just west of Denver. Missy was kept in a pasture near Sixth and Kipling by the high school about a mile from her home. I would saddle Missy and ride all day, mostly to the fairgrounds about five miles away, where I rode in Western Ears. Missy and I sometimes led the patterns with the American flag in hand, or we rode Liberty, which is bareback over jumps, just a wire around Missy's neck. Some days I'd start out very early, ride north on Kipling to 32nd, head west and explore Tabletop Mountain, and get home just before dark. Other days, I'd just watch the football players from a small knoll above the playing field. With my parents' divorce and being forced to grow up, Missy ended up at the ranch too far away to visit easily. But the lesson she taught me is something I'd like to bottle up and give away. I was blessed to have horses again in my late 40s. I started much heavier due to a botched surgery, and after realizing I could not balance nor ride like I did as a kid, I started taking lessons. I was fortunate to have the best horsemen in the state teaching me how to be a true horsewoman. I finally bought my forever horse buck and soon started traveling, doing clinics and competing. The ignorant would say I was too fat to ride, but professionals said I rode lighter than the skinny girls. Every comment, whether good or ugly, drove me to improve on our partnership and keep going. I know Buck and I were an inspiration for those who were also told they couldn't, into knowing that they could do anything that their heart desires. But my life had other plans to slow me down. In 2017, getting ready to perform at the Horse Expo, I came out of my horse trailer on a cold morning to flip the breaker on for heat and stepped into a hole fracturing my ankle. Later that year, I was helping load a generator in my truck when it fell and shattered my leg. A month in the hospital and five surgeries later, humbled, God took this time of physical healing to help heal my heart. He lifted the veil and had me take a good look at what was happening in the world. Things I kind of knew of, but I really didn't want to know. I thought there was nothing I could do to stop the world from spinning out of control anyway. But like the ugly, too fat to write comments, it drove me to see God's creation as worth fighting for and to never give up on humanity. He also showed me the power to create a life to thrive in. So I did what I could by getting involved and going where God led, which isn't always easy, and was gifted when he had me revisit plans I have for a healing center for the brokenhearted. 
healing with horses and with God's real medicine. So it is. God wins. And yes, my partner Buck still carries me with joy so I can see God's beauty between his ears. Why'd we go? Because we had to. We couldn't stay still. We couldn't keep ourselves in and the light was dimming in our eyes, so we went. There were lots of reasons and it doesn't matter much which straw broke the camel's back, but it broke. A plot twist was necessary, an adventure was calling us out to see what we hadn't seen and go where we hadn't gone. So in 2021, we sold it all and moved out of our house and into a fifth wheel we named Rhoda. We gathered our children and our dog, packed our favorite books and our most loved clothes, stuck what was left in storage and set out like tumbleweeds, uprooted and taken by the wind. Day one, we felt our hearts begin to lighten. We watched the water and the trees and the flowers along the way. We found a lake in Nebraska and sat with bison in South Dakota. They showed us that the quiet, humid air was worth breathing in slowly. They sang songs in a language I couldn't quite decipher, but could certainly understand. Then we ventured on. The air was different. The light was different. The light was returning to our eyes. We saw flat land that stretched on for miles, got long phone calls with friends and our mamas. We were humbled by the farmlands and crossed the wide Missouri. It snowed on us in Sturgis and we learned about Crazy Horse. We saw the coolest reptile zoo and we thought we could stay, but we didn't. We got stuck in the mud in Montana. A sheep farmer and his wife helped rescue us. We gave them hugs. We parked way too close to some train tracks one night. We explored Lewistown on bikes, walked a labyrinth, and watched a movie in a theater and thought we could definitely stay, but we didn't. There were more farms, and we met a pig whose snout is the stuff of children's books, and we got stuck in the mud again. It was okay. We laughed and were rescued again by another farmer and his tractor. The weather was colder, and we made it to familiar smiles. We sat with my dad, had coffee in the mornings, and carved pumpkins together. The world was brighter. Then there was the ocean. We thought we could stay, but we didn't. The loneliest highway. We drove it. Yes, we'd been chased by ghosts, but we outpaced. And somewhere in Tombstone, we buried the past. We kicked dust down Allen Street, ate lunch at Big Nose Kate's, and stared a long while at the gallows pole. We learned and climbed stairs and peered down into long since abandoned mines. Lunch in Mexico, an alpaca farm outside Sierra Vista. And did I stand where Pancho Villa had in the Gadsden Hotel? We were laughing, talking, and looking for a place to land. A home with a yard for the kids, for the dog, for a garden, a community, family. So why do we come back? Because we wanted to. We needed to be tumbleweeds and I'm glad we were. The truth is we are still tumbleweeds and I would do it all again and someday I hope to get the opportunity. Until then, I'll always be grateful for the road and my family and the time we had seeing what we'd never seen and going where we'd never gone. I thought I knew myself. That was before I found myself stirring the poop in the bottom of a composting toilet. That's how you really come to know yourself. 
Before this point, I was a city girl. I wore high heels in the latest fashion and rarely left the house without makeup. I crisscrossed the country, living in big cities, D.C., L.A., Portland. I worked hard building my career and landed my dream job at the Denver VA in my home state of Colorado. Sure, I would be there until I retired. I was also a weekend warrior. I played hard, snowboarding, hiking, backpacking, climbing. I was what you might call busy. Then, one day, everything changed. I was driving in the car and heard a story that came on the radio. I was about to change the station when I had a strong impression that I should listen to this story. Before I knew it, I was living on the side of Pikes Peak in a cabin built in 1923. There was no electricity or running water, and our only heat source was a wood-burning stove, for which we had to gather, cut, and split all the wood. It's true when they say a wood-burning stove heats you twice. There was also no road access. It was a six and a half mile hike with 4,000 feet of elevation gain to get to our home at 10,200 feet. It didn't take much for me to convince my newish boyfriend to join me in this new gig. They're looking for couples was about all I had to say. We were the new caretakers at bar camp, which was a waypoint and rustic bed and breakfast on the bar trail that went from the base of Pikes Peak in Manitou Springs to the summit at 14,115 feet. I should say that I was compelled to take this journey by a strong voice inside me that said this was where I was meant to be, but it did not fit the path I had in mind for myself. I had no intention of living with my newish boyfriend on the side of a mountain with none of the comforts of life that I was used to. On our first day of training, we ran an aid station for a running race that goes to the summit of Pikes Peak. Then, while the rest of the volunteers got to sleep or go for a hike, we learned how to trap a rat that had taken up residence in the bunkhouse, stirred the poop in the composting toilet, carried 100-pound propane tanks to the cabin, and learned how to prepare dinner for 45-plus people. After that long day, I sat on a bench with my boyfriend and cried. I wasn't sure I was cut out for it all. I'm a girl who gets pedicures and massages and colors her hair every six weeks. But that strong voice spoke to me. This was where I was supposed to be. I learned that I was cut out for it. In fact, I was great at it. I didn't need the comforts of life to find joy. In fact, it was easier to find without them. In that space on the side of the mountain, I found myself in a whole new way. I found stillness and connection in a way I could never find in the big cities. I found peace and I found love. Love for myself exactly as I am. Love for the thousands of strangers who became friends, if even just for a few minutes. Love for nature and quiet in a way I'd never known. And even love for the person I'd choose to spend the rest of my life with. I found me, the authentic me, who still enjoys a good massage, but who isn't afraid to wield a chainsaw or otherwise get my hands dirty. I found that in stillness, away from the busyness of life, I learned to experience true love. Have you ever had someone truly listen to you, to what you had to say? What did it feel like? Someday, I'd like to know. 3,000 miles from home, I went to a contra dance in Santa Rosa, California, because that was the closest thing to home I had in this strange new place. I was welcomed with cheery smiles and lovingly embraced into a new community by everyone except for one man with a very serious look on his face. In passing conversation, I asked this man why he was not smiling. He said he could not smile or even have fun because several dancers were offbeat. I asked him, has that stopped anyone else from smiling or having fun? This man gave me that classic head-tilted, curious and confused look. The swing ended and we finished out the dance with our respective partners. Throughout the rest of the dance, I occasionally noticed the serious-faced man glancing at me, appearing to still be confused, but I didn't think much of it. 
the dance ran late with overflow of joy and laughter. So at 1 a.m., I found myself walking to my car alone in an empty lot, except for the man following behind me. I just want to explain, he said, and outspilled a tale of rigid parents and his childhood woes. My inner monologue, now racing, torn between run, run now, and just take a minute to listen, took only seconds, then passed when I saw this man burst into tears. My inner monologue, now quite the debate, had the added, do I give him a hug, added to it. Having maintained eye contact, as I was taught, I watched this man as he dried his eyes, lifted his head to meet mine, and said, I have been in therapy for decades and never felt so good. Thank you for listening. Then smiling, turned and walked away. It was this moment when I realized that making time to be there and just listen can make a world of difference for someone. I truly enjoy helping people, so I became a listener, and I love it. I'm a listener, and perhaps with a gift of storytelling, I'm a listener who will also be heard. <laughs>